Our investigation unearthed a chilling safety bulletin from 2018, issued by the US government's aviation authority, the FAA, exposing a critical flaw in the fuel control switches of Boeing aircraft, including the 787-8. The report made it clear the defect could lead to catastrophic engine failure mid-flight. The bulletin spelled it out in stark terms. Boeing received reports from operators of Model 737 airplanes that the fuel control switches were installed with the locking feature disengaged. If the locking feature is disengaged, the switch would be exposed to the potential of inadvertent operation, which could result in an unintended consequence, such as an in-flight engine shutdown. Could this buried warning hold the key to the tragedy of Air India Flight 171? Let's find out and tackle more of your top questions with Captain Steve. Welcome to a special edition of Ask the Captain. We're gonna talk about your questions from Air India 171. Now that the preliminary report is out, we've been inundated with thousands of questions. We're gonna to try to get to as many as we can. So this might be a multi-part series of Ask the Captain. Uh, we can only do so many at a time, but we'll try to get to as many of the pertinent questions as we can. Let's jump into the first one. Roman Joseph 848 says, could the fuel switches have already been in the cutoff position at takeoff and the engines only shut down once the aircraft lifted off and the gear retracted? No, that's not how they work. They're in a detent that holds them into place. The engines would cease running. You wouldn't be able to push the power up to take off. So no, that's that wouldn't have happened. Sorry. All right, SR Snoor writes, uh, I'm just an aviation enthusiast, not a pilot, but I'm curious about the mechanics of the fuel control switches. You mentioned they have detents at each position. Is it possible for a switch to be left halfway between detents? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the answer to that is, I mean, anything's possible, but the way they, they are uh, built is that they're meant to lock into one another and there's a little overlap where they they hold each other in and then they're spring loaded so could you could you like put them up on top and just hold it they, they would probably fall back down because the back side of them is sloped with that spring pressure to come back to the cutoff position so they would have to be no i don't i don't think there's any way i've never seen that happen uh in order for the pilot to do it they got to pull it out place it in and then it clicks into place and it stays in that position. That's why you couldn't bump it and knock it out. You could grab it and pull it. You have to pull it out and down. So I don't I don't think that's a possibility. That's a great question. All right. Uh, let's see, Latif Hag writes, uh, if the fuel control switches were placed in the cutoff position during the takeoff roll or shortly after liftoff, wouldn't the aircraft's systems, especially the airborne logic, generate a warning either visually or orally, it seems like a, a critical situation that should trigger an alert. Is there no such warning built into the system? I, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I've, so I've never done this. Uh, I'm gonna assume that there is. It's probably gonna say on your screen, fuel cutoff. Uh, you're gonna know that already because you can see that the fuel switches are in the wrong position or you're gonna see the other person reach over and grab them at an inappropriate time. The biggest indication that they're not in the right position is right here, your ears. You're gonna hear the engines immediately spool down and that you're expecting that big roar to continue after takeoff. If you hear and then and the airplane begins to settle in that you know that something was wrong. And so, yeah, that's, that's a great question, but no, I don't, I don't think you need a warning in front of you to tell you that that's going on. I'm gonna assume that there is one, but I don't ever wanna experience that. All right, I care 7151. This incident brings up a major controversy, the long-standing opposition by pilot unions to installing video cameras in cockpits. Uh, in your opinion as a pilot, is it time uh, for this to change to ensure accountability and get clear answers to tragedies like this? I don't think a, a camera in the cockpit would have uh, prevented this at all. Now, it might give you a clear picture of exactly what happened, uh, is there an argument to be made for that? I suppose the cockpit voice recorder kind of does the same. The flight data recorder does the same. Um, all you're missing is the visual component to it. So I think you've got all the, the information there. I think the fear with the, the camera in the, in the cockpit is that somebody is gonna leak it and they're gonna use it. Uh, and, and I understand as a pilot, you know what? I, I don't want that stuff getting out there. Uh, 
if somebody were to leak something that while I'm in flight and I don't know, I never do it, but let's say there's another pilot that's reading a magazine or doing something they're not supposed to do in the cockpit. That's, that's the concern with that. I don't think it would have uh, prevented this accident at all. All right. Uh, next is uh, Nadine Joseph. Many people are speculating about a cover up. They find it uh, convenient to blame the pilots who can no longer defend themselves. From your perspective, how much pressure exists for manufacturers like Boeing and national authorities to steer an investigation away from mechanical or design flaws? I understand that perspective. And I think there's a natural cynicism out there amongst all of us. And I'm the most cynical person on the planet. I'm always looking for some reason behind something. And I, but in this case, those airplanes were operating exactly as they were designed. This is not a design flaw. This is not a cover up by Boeing or GE. This is not a convenient blaming of the pilots because now they're dead. I think as you look at objectively, anybody looks at the information that they're given and what we could see from the outside videos. And now we know from the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder, this was a human intervention that caused this accident plain and simple. Uh, I wish it was something else. Uh, I, you know, we, everybody in this space on social media didn't want to go here. Right. And you saw that in our, in our early reporting, we didn't want to go to, it, it was a, a human that placed those fuel control switches to cut off. We, it, it's, we just don't want to go there, but now we know at this point. All right. Excellent question. Uh, the center profiler 5539, how often are pilots required to do psychological evaluations? They aren't, they aren't. The psychological evaluation takes place, um, from pilot to pilot in the cockpit. I said yesterday at the end of my video, uh, and I'm going to repeat it again. I'm going to encourage my pilots that are listening to this video to work into their pre-flight brief. How are you doing? Ask your fellow pilots, how are you doing? And don't let it be just a surfacey question. Say, hey, is everything okay at home? Are you ready to fly today? And you might find every once in a while, somebody's gonna confide in you. Hey, you know what? Things are kind of rough at home and maybe I shouldn't go flying today. Asking that question is the first step in a process that may avert an accident like this, right? Good question. So we got, please play good games. The yeah. FAA issued special airworthiness information bulletin, and there's the number on December 17th, 2018, regarding the potential disengagement of the fuel control switches uh, locking feature. I think what that bulletin was about was the installation of the switch, because you could install the switch upside down, in which case it would just be impossible to put it in the run position. It would, it, since it's spring-loaded, it would always default back to the cutoff position. Uh, and so I don't think that was the situation here on this Air India 787 because you would know it the very first time you tried to engage the fuel control switches. You just simply couldn't. They'd always go back to that cutoff position. So that was an airworthiness bulletin. Boeing, uh, the NTSB, nobody has put out any directives to look at anything connected with the uh, the physical parts of the airplane. So they're indicating that there was nothing wrong with the airplane. It was operating according to design, but that's a very insightful question. All right, next is uh, Eric M9768. On July 11th, 2025, a reader made the Aviation Herald aware of a service bulletin released by General Electric and the FAA. The bulletin was, and here's the number, which recommended uh, the replacement of the MN4 microprocessor on ECU with respect to the engine fuel and control uh, stating, I, I don't know about this particular uh, bulletin. Uh, bulletins are just for information, to, just to give you a kinds of a heads up. An error worthiness directive is like a recall item where you have to do something about it. You have to replace it, you have to fix it, you have to repair it somehow. Uh, bulletins are just a heads up and I, I don't know enough to speak about this one. All right. Yumuri4 writes, a student pilot and others have raised a critical point about mental health in aviation. They say the current system discourages pilots from seeking any kind of mental health support for fear of losing their license, potentially for life. Uh, do you believe this culture creates a dangerous situation and what needs to change to allow pilots to seek help without ending their careers? Excellent, excellent insight. And the answer to that is, yeah, it, it kind of does, but the culture is changing. And that's why on this channel, we're going to start a conversation going forward about uh, the mental health and the emotional health of pilots.
at my airline. Uh, they started about 25 years ago a, a very robust program called Project Wingman, where pilots with no jeopardy involved could pick up the phone and talk to somebody and get the ball rolling to get the, the, you know, their mental health in line. And that program has been exported to a lot of other airlines. Um, how far and well developed is it? Is the FAA on board with it completely? Those things need to change, but we need to put public pressure on the government and, and airlines to say, let's take care of the mental health of our pilots in a high stress situation without jeopardy of losing their livelihood. All right. So again, the public is going to have a lot to say about this. And this is the time to speak up, folks, and uh, talk to your representatives, talk to the people at the FAA, talk to the airlines, send them a text, send them a message and let them know what you think about this. All right. That's a good one. That's a good insight. All right. Uh, time for you to fly a pilot who flies ember air jets points out that on his uh, aircraft the engines won't shut down via the cutoff switches unless specific logic is met like thrust levers at idle he finds it alarming that a modern aircraft like the 787 might not have a similar error prevention logic can you explain the design philosophy behind the 787's fuel control switch system that uh, and why it uh, might differ. That's actually a, a great observation. And that might be something that Boeing or GE looks at down the road to help prevent something like this from happening again. Certainly the conversation that we're having about it now is important to kind of push that narrative along. The only thing I would say about the Ember Air that I don't like in that system is this. Let's say I'm on short final coming into land. I'm all configured. I got the gear down. I got the flaps down. I'm about two or three minutes away from touching down and I get an engine fire on one of my wings or one of my uh, engines and I've got to shut that fire off right away. I want the engine to shut down immediately. I don't want to have to wait until some air logic thing figures it all out and 10 or 15 seconds later, it decides that the engine is going to shut down. I want to have that control. Now, having said that, this thing that happened with Air India 171 would be the exception to that rule. So I'm, I'm all for looking into this, but you know, maybe there is something that they can put into the, uh, the air logic that would help prevent something like this from happening again. That's a good insight. All right, Kate Bat 7538 says this, if this was a deliberate act, why would the pilot make a mayday call? Psychologically, that seems like a very strange thing to do. Furthermore, how do investigators know that the physical switches were in the cutoff position versus the flight data recorder simply recording a signal uh, to cut off fuel, which could have been caused by an electrical fault. This wasn't caused by an electrical fault. Um, those are mechanical switches that get placed in the position and the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder are very detailed uh, bits of information, right? They're going to tell, they're going to show you that they were actually placed in that position and then placed back into that position. It's not just the electronic signal that they're sending out. Um, the Air India pilots went into the simulator and tried to duplicate this by a total electrical failure and they couldn't simulate a dual engine failure. So that's most likely not it. Uh, but this, you know, and again, there's two pilots in the cockpit. One of them most likely did the fuel cutoff and the other made the mayday call. So why would the one cutting it off make a mayday call? Yeah, you're right, that doesn't make any sense, but there are two pilots in that cockpit. I'm thinking the other pilot made the mayday call. Good question. Pavelote writes this, the fuel switches don't operate the valves directly. They uh, instruct the aircraft's computer system, the ECAM to do so, that is correct. All right, is it possible that a major electrical bus failure could have told the computer to shut off the fuel valves? Uh, the answer to that is anything is possible. That's not what happened in this situation. The airplane was operating the way it was designed to operate. The Air India pilots went into the simulator, tried to simulate a total electrical failure and that would produce a dual engine failure. It simply wouldn't. That's not what happened here. They were placed physically to cut off. All right, we've got, uh, let's see who's next here. A lot of letters and numbers. All right. As a Boeing 737B1 engineer, I have to ask, could this have been a cyber attack? Is it possible on this aircraft? No. no. There's no Bluetooth data back and forth that, no, it, it, that just lined through that one. That, that couldn't quite possibly happen. KK Robertson, the one. Uh, I'm having a problem believing this was a deliberate act. If both engines failed, Seconds after takeoff, is it possible to dump the fuel? If not, is the next best option to cut the fuel to the engines 
before impact in hopes to prevent an explosion. No, no, none of that has anything to do with it. This wasn't a fuel dumping situation. And I know there's a hopeful part of all of us that doesn't want to believe this was a deliberate act. I, I get that. That's, that's actually the best of us. The best part inside of us doesn't want to believe that somebody did this intentionally. I don't know how you get away from the facts in this one. Um, having said that, there was nothing they could have done to prevent the explosion at the end. The airplane is fuel, full of fuel. Uh, do not want a handle, 1111. <laughs> one thing uh, doesn't make sense, though. In the original video of the aircraft taking off, the rat deploys, but the aircraft continues to climb. Uh, this means at least one engine is still getting thrust for a while. Uh, so it's not a dual engine sim uh, simultaneous shutdown. You're correct. It wasn't a dual engine simultaneous shutdown. The fuel control switches were placed to cut off one second apart from each other. So the left engine, the number one, flamed out a minute or second before the right engine uh, did. I don't know how you saw the rat deploy um, according to your description here, because we didn't see the rat until the second video where the airplane was already descending into the buildings off the end of the runway. So I don't know where you came up with that information. All right, uh, Sasson Forever says, from my understanding, there is one uh, conceivable scenario when we have a dual engine fire, when we cut off fuel to both engines before starting the fire extinguisher procedure. But as you said, uh, this almost never happens during the first moments of the plane uh, being airborne. That's correct. It doesn't. Uh, and the fuel handles, the fire handles were not pulled. All right. The uh, flight data recorder, the preliminary report said the fuel control switches were placed from run to cut off one second apart from each other. So it wasn't the fuel handles being pulled. All right. Ephidol uh, off 610. Uh, but why didn't the second pilot do anything? Well, the second pilot did do something. So let's assume the one pilot cut the fuel to both engines. The other pilot uh, looked at that pilot and said, what did you do or why did you do that? Uh, there was a denial on that part. Uh, the other pilot then within 10 seconds grabs both fuel control switches and places them to run. That's an incredible presence of mind to think to do that right while still flying the airplane and trying to get some power out of those engines so that's a, the sequence of events that happened um, in the cockpit all right well that's it for this episode of ask the captain thank you for the questions keep them coming we're going to try to put as many together as we possibly can excellent job today i hope you got a satisfactory answer we're going to do this in several parts there's going to be some more ask the captains related to air india 171 now you know i'm captain steve this has been ask the captain <laughs>